Drawing is one of those skills that you'll be working on for your entire career. It's really a secret weapon for motion designers, allowing them to get ideas out of their heads as quickly as possible. Plus, if you develop even some basic drawing skills, you can use them to create assets that you can clean up and turn into production assets in Illustrator. Let's look at some examples and see what else we can learn from this assignment. This exercise is a lot of fun because we get so much variety from what you all turn in. There's a lot of creative freedom here, so you get to really explore some styles. I have four different projects here that I want to walk through and talk about some things that are working and a couple of things that we might be able to improve. So let's start with this launch pad uh, right here. This is the finished product of a rocket ship at sunrise just before it launches. So I really love this piece because of all the little details that were put into it. And one of the main reasons I really like it is because this is a really well executed gradient in the background here for that sunrise. This was done in Illustrator, but it looks very realistic like it's an actual sunrise in the background. And the subtle little details we get here on the shading on the opposite side of this silhouetted rocket and launch pad really adds to realism on this piece even though it's all made up of vectors. So let's take a look at the sketches and see how this designer was kind of exploring some ideas. So we have four different sketches here and they're all pretty wildly different. There are some similarities between the first two, seeing what two different rockets kind of looking like uh, in orbit would be like at this same kind of composition. But then we also have the, the one that this designer ultimately went with, with the sunrise and the rocket silhouette. And then we have one that's just completely out of left field with an alien little guy, uh, you know, piloting this rocket. And then maybe this is another planet or a galaxy or something in the background. So it's really great to see these sketches and just see this designer's thought process, trying different things and then eventually choosing to do something that's just completely different than all of the others. Let's take a look at the actual Illustrator file to kind of see how this was created. So this is very well organized. We've got a noise layer right up at the top. So if I zoom in nice and close, here you can see we have a little bit of grain showing up over top of everything. This is really smart when you're doing things with gradients because you can really get a lot of banding with compression on gradients. But adding in that noise breaks up the gradient just enough to help with the compression so that it doesn't do too much of that banding. So turning that noise off, it looks still pretty good inside of Illustrator, but you do even in Illustrator see that banding happening. So implementing just the slightest bit of noise can really help that. What I was really interested in was how in the world this designer made the sun because it looks like a flare, like it's actually blending into the sunrise so, uh, super realistically. So let's take a look at how this was done. Under the sky layer, I'll unlock that, we have these two ellipse objects right here. So let me turn everything off except for the sky and then see how this was built. Uh, I'm going to go to my properties panel and open up the appearance panel. And we have a couple of effects applied on top of this. So let's start at the bottom and work our way up. Our opacity is set to 74% and the blend mode is set to color dodge. Now if I turn this up to 100% and take that off of color dodge, put it to normal, then we start to see the shape a little bit better. Next up we have a Gaussian blur, which is just blurring everything out. If I turn it off, there's our shape that's very spiky and just abstract. Next up is the fill, which has the gradient in it going from this light purple to the black or dark purple. And then no stroke, that's why we see this red line. And then finally a roughen. So if I turn that off, it becomes just an ellipse, a circle with this gradient. So the way that this designer stacked all of these effects was brilliant in turning it into something that was very abstract and eventually looked exactly like a flare coming off the sun and it's blending into the background so, so well. So let's change that back to color dodge, which is similar to screen. It's just a little bit more uh, intense. It gives some more brightness that actually simulates light a little bit better. And we just have two of those same exact objects stacked on top of each other to create that sun. And then it looks like we have even another sphere or circle right down here for that. Combining all of those together using different blending modes really sells the effect of that being the sun. Another really, really great detail is the, the clouds that are showing up here. If I turn the sun off, you can see these really intricate looking clouds that are just beautiful. They look like they were painted on there. The reason why they look like they were painted is because if we isolate one of them, I'll ungroup all of them actually, and we'll find, let's say, this one. 
and take a look. This is just a straight line that has been brushed with a painterly brush that we can find inside of our brushes palette. Let me get this panel open. And there we go. We can see that it, it was just one of these brush strokes that was applied to the stroke. So I could manipulate this however I want to make the clouds look a little bit different. And it all updates just like any other vector path. I could even change the brush stroke. If I didn't like that one in particular, I could change it to something like this or this or this. But I think the one that the des this designer chose actually does very much look like clouds. And that is just another excellent use of vectors and blending modes, opacities to get it all looking the way that it should uh, to really make a realistic looking effect. But even if I zoom in nice and close, you can see that there was a lot of thought put into all of these little objects, the little buildings on the ground, the parts of the launch pad. This designer put a lot of thought into how to make this look realistic. If we take a look at their reference images on Pinterest, they even categorized three different boards to help them get to that point in Illustrator. So we have some sunrise uh, pins on their own board. And this has just a lot of really graphical styles for treating a sunset in lots of different ways, exploring lots of different styles for it, as well as some actual photo references of real sunrises to see how that works. And on this one, the Eiffel Tower, how it silhouettes the tower against the bright background. And then in the second board, we have illustration styles where the designer was exploring just ways to treat the actual graphics and how the art direction could look. And then there's even a third board with real photographical references of actual rockets and other elements that this designer pulled is, uh, as in inspiration into their own design. So just a really, really great uh, job here from start to finish, from research to sketching to actually execution. It just really turned out nice. Well done. All right, next up, let's take a look at our rowboat rocket. I loved the creativity on this one and the art style, everything about it, again, I love. It just has a really great composition, the textures and the effects, and the fact that this designer attempted to illustrate a character is just phenomenal. The, the, it turned out so well. It has so much personality. Characters are one of the most complex things that you can attempt to illustrate, and I think this is just working so well. Let's take a look at the sketches for this one, and I'll pull them all up at once. So we have four different sketches here, and within some of them there are some more. But we have a couple of different perspectives on the boat, and especially in this shot right here, you can see that the designer was thinking through how to frame this boat in order to add rockets onto it and give the, the illustration a lot of depth. So one technique this designer used was drawing some perspective guides. This is a great technique for helping you get your perspective correct when you go to actually illustrate it, but they uh, basically just made a box that has a vanishing point and, and scales down so that you can then align your drawing to those walls. And we can see that repeated through a few of these drawings. It's something that's very technically difficult to get good at, but I think this designer has done an excellent job at incorporating that and the final result speaks for itself. We have a nice close sketch up of the character here and a little bit more rough version here. So you can see that the designer was really just trying things and refining them as they went. Ultimately, this looks like the sketch that wound up in the final, and if we open up the Illustrator file, we can see how this was built, all using just simple vector paths. If I go to outline mode, you can see how that's done. And there are, again, lots of details in this character that really help sell the, the entire illustration. It's very cartoony. It has a lot of personality, but it's just very well executed. And then after this stage was done, the designer went into Photoshop and added in some texture, which really finished off this illustration and made it just pop off those vector flat 2D graphics. We've got the shading around the character with these nice gritty brushes, some nice glows in here, which it looks like this is just a really soft oval. If I turn this to nor normal, it's just a blurred out orange splotch, basically. But if you change it to overlay, there you go. It looks like it's actually blending, like it's a, a light glow coming off of those rockets. 
And then the entire composition is also something I'm in love with. This smoke, the way that it kind of just envelops the left side of the frame is really focusing your attention onto this side and to the little boy that's hanging onto the boat for dear life. It just adds a lot of motion to this still image and I think it's just doing a great job. Let's take a look at this designer's Pinterest inspiration board. You can see that again this designer was exploring lots of different graphical treatments for how they could do their art direction as well as finding boats that uh, will give them some reference on the perspective and how to draw the boat. This one's even flying in the air so that's a lot of fun. But this is just a really great collection of inspiration from both photographic references and illustrations. And applied to this final design, it just turned out so great. All right, next up we have a rocket halftone. So let's look at the final piece. This is so much fun. I love the personality and the art direction in this. It feels very retro. And I think that is exactly what this designer was going for. One of my favorite parts about this design was the use of halftones, which are these little dots right here. That is a process that was developed to allow printers to add shading into illustrations or even using or printing photographs with one ink because it allows you to take one color like this lighter yellow color and the closer together the dots are the thicker and uh, brighter that color looks and as you space them out down here it looks like it's fading out into the color that's below it so it's a way to kind of fake shading using a single color or overlaying that color on top of another Nowadays, it's pretty much just used as a stylistic effect because we have much more advanced printing technologies. But the halftone effect really throws it back to this retro style, and I think this designer did an excellent job with it. Let's look at this designer's inspiration boards right here. And sure enough, we have a lot of these Art Deco kind of older style posters that this designer pulled inspiration from. And you can clearly see that reflected in this final piece. From the way that the, the building is just a simple outline and some of the colors are offset, it looks like an old screen print. Even the colors feel very much like that era. And I just love all this really nice and gritty graphical printmaking inspiration that the designer chose to, to use as inspiration. Now I want to bring this into Illustrator or open up the Illustrator file really quickly because this halftone is actually vector. If I switch to my outline mode, you can see all of those little dots uh, broken up into individual paths, which means that you can easily change this color to whatever you want. So I could you know, make this darker and there we go. This is actually something that a lot of designers wonder how to do in Illustrator, but it's not always that straightforward. So really quickly, I want to show you how you can make a halftone like this. So I'm going to just make a new layer inside of this document. Let me turn off everything that I don't need to see. I'll keep the background on there and then I'll make a new layer. OK, and then I'm going to add a rectangle. It doesn't matter really what size it is, and I'm going to fill it with a gradient and I'll make it go from the top down, just rotate it actually. There we go. All right, so what we need to do is generate that halftone effect. Well, both Illustrator and Photoshop have an effect under Pixelate called Color Halftone. Now, we can't see a preview of how this works until we apply it because it's a Photoshop effect and not a, a Illustrator effect. But uh, I'm just going to leave all these numbers at their default and click OK to show you what it does. Okay, there we go. So let me zoom in 100% and this is really hard to look at. And the reason it's so hard to look at is because we're previewing this on the GPU. So if I switch this to my uh, pixel preview, it will rasterize the image and it's still a little hard to look at, but this is actually what the effect would do. We're getting a lot of different colors in here and to make this even easier to see, I'm gonna go back into the effect and I'm gonna turn the max radius up to 16, double the size and click OK. This is controlling the size of the dots that make up this pattern. And now with that set, you can see these colors and these dots overlapping a lot easier. Now, Halftone is still used today in the print world, and it uses cyan, magenta, yellow, and black colors overlaid on top of each other. When they're all combined, they become black, and when you spread them out, you start to see more white. For this particular effect, we don't want four different colors of ink, so I want to make all of these dots line up on each other so that they all become black. In order to do that, I'm going to go back into the color halftone and look at channel 1, 2, 3, and 4. That is C, M, Y, and K for cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. And they're all at different angles. But if I line them all up, say set them all to 45 degrees, and click OK, 
then they're all going to be applied at the exact same spot and we get this black and white halftone pattern which is exactly what I want. Now I think I want to make the dots just a little bit bigger so let me change this up to 24 and see how that looks. That's pretty good. You can play with that number to get the dots to be however big you want them to be. I'll take pixel preview off for now because now it's a little easier to see, but you can update this rectangle however you need to. If you want to make it much wider, you can. As you can see, my computer is slowing down because this is a Photoshop raster effect that has to update every time I make a change to this object. So that's something you have to get used to, but I can still do things like change the gradient. If I wanted to add a little bit more contrast into here, all right, so let's say that I'm happy with the way that this halftone pattern is looking, but now I want to add it to my design with some color. Well, first of all, I could just take this entire object and change the blending mode from normal to multiply, and that will get rid of all of the white and blend into what's behind it. But I can't change the color of that black because that is what the effect is actually producing. In order to get that, I need to first rasterize it and then convert it to vectors. And this is a little bit of a process, but it's actually fairly straightforward once you understand how it works. First of all, I want to rasterize this object so it becomes pixels and is no longer a vector editable effect. So I'm going to come up to Object, down to Rasterize, and then leave the resolution at 300 ppi. Make sure my background is set to Transparent, and then click OK. This might take a little bit of time, but there we go. Now I have a raster-based image. If I press Command-Y, we don't see anything because it is just an image now. All right, with that done, I now need to convert this back to vector so that I can grab these dots and change the color. We can do this using what's called image trace inside of Illustrator, and you can do this with any graphic. It doesn't usually look that great, but it can take basically the contours and contrast of any image that you bring in and convert it to vectors. With something like this, where it's pure white and pure black, and I'm not concerned with this being perfectly circular on every dot like the actual pixels are, it's actually going to work out great. So let me grab my image trace button up here, and it's going to give me a warning that say this might take a little bit of time because of how big my image is. That's fine. I'm going to click OK, and it's going to take some time analyzing the image and then calculating how it can recreate it using vector paths automatically. So it'll take a little bit of time, but there we go. We've got our updated image, and this is now vector. Now, I haven't expanded it, so I can't make any adjustments to it yet, but it's giving me a preview of what it will look like if these are the settings that I use. Now, I could stop right there, but I want to go into my image trace settings by clicking on the image trace panel and then take a look at some adjustments I can make. I'm not going to cover all of this right now, just what I need to do in order to make this look better. Right now, my mode is set to black and white, so there are no colors being introduced, just pure black, just pure white, which is exactly what I want. But first thing I want to do is turn off Ignore White, which is under Advanced. So if I come down to the Advanced panel, click on Ignore White, then it's going to eliminate everything that is white and only leave me with those black dots. Again, exactly what I want. This will take some time to update again, but there we go. It's done. I want to make sure that the corners are set to as low as possible because these were circles, so I want them to remain as circular as possible. So let me turn the corners all the way down. And then I want to make sure that snap curves to lines is not checked. I'll undo that, and that should make everything a little bit more round. Let's pay attention to some of these right here that aren't perfectly circular and see what happens. There we go. Now those are much more perfect circles. They're not 100% perfect, but they're a lot more round. Uh, that really is all I need to do. You could play with things like the threshold to make this a little bit more filled in or a little bit more sparse. There are a lot of things you can do there, but for my purposes, this is going to work fine. Now I want to click on Expand, and these are now vector paths. They're all gray because that's the color of my layer, but I can change that to whatever I want. And because this is pure vector now, I can change the color to be something else. So let's just sample this orange and then maybe make it a little bit more red. And there we go. Now we've got a gradient going from this lighter orange to this darker red. And you can change this color however you feel like you need to in order to fit your design. But that is a way to have a really stylistic version of shading using these halftones right inside of Illustrator while preserving the vector scalability that Illustrator gives us. 
All right, let's take a look at our last example, which is a house right here. Here's the designer's original sketch. And I think this is a perfectly decent looking sketch. I don't know if this designer had any more uh, process before this one, but this is the one that they ultimately went with. And here is the final result. So a really great translation of that sketch to vectors. There are some things in this that I think we could improve, however, and there's one technique that was used in both this example and in this retro rocket illustration, which is grain for shading that can be done a little bit more effectively than the way it's been executed in both of these examples. So let's talk about how we might improve this design a little bit. Well, first of all, let's talk about the grain. This designer chose to add grain over everything as a design element, which is great, but it's done in a way that's a little bit redundant and can be done much more efficiently. So let me show you how this designer handled it. Let's focus on this panel of the house right here, which is under this group. I'm just going to ungroup it to make it a little easier to work with. But if we take a look at these two objects right here, they're both taking up the same space. And this kind of thing is repeated throughout the entire illustration. There are duplicates of each object. And the reason why there are duplicates is because the top copy is the grain. And then the underlying copy is the color. This is what I was talking about being a little redundant. So let me turn off everything except for that path. Whoops, can't turn off a layer. Everything except these two paths right here. So what's been done is this grain layer has been set to 39% opacity and just slapped right on top of the original color. And while that does work to apply grain to the layer behind it, we can actually do this using one object. So let me just move this over here for a second. And I'll take this object and look at what it's made up of. It just has a fill, no stroke. Very simple and straightforward. This layer uses a grain effect to apply the grain. So let's add that in. I'm going to go into this object under the appearance panel, effects, texture, and then grain. And this will allow us to add grain. And I believe this designer used the grain type of regular, and these are probably the same settings. So I'll click OK, but that's applying it uniformly over everything. This copy was using a, uh, a gradient fill rather than just a solid fill. So I need to get that fill over here. So what I need to do is actually make a new fill and change this to being a gradient and then make sure that that gradient, if I can open this up, is rotated 90 degrees, actually negative 90 degrees so that it goes from the lightest point up here to the darkest point down here. All right, so I now have all of the elements of both of these objects in this one single object, but obviously it doesn't look right. We don't see any of this color because this gradient fill is just straight on top of it. And the grain is being applied to everything and it's really intense. Well, first of all, let's change the blend mode of this fill by twirling down this arrow to multiply. That's going to blend into the background. If I turn off the grain, you can see that now just the dark parts of that fill are being blended on top of the actual pink color. But how do we get this grain to also blend into that purple? Well, you don't have to apply the grain to the entire object. You can just apply the grain to the fill. And now that grain is going to take the opacity and blend mode of whatever you set that fill to. So on this layer, we had the opacity of the entire thing set to 39. But on this copy, I'm going to take the fill opacity of that gradient and turn it down to 39. And now contained within this one object, I have all of that blending happening. No need for duplicate objects. I can turn everything back on. And I have the same effect using half the number of objects. Now, this might need a little bit of tweaking to get it to match the colors of everything else just because of the way that it's being blended now. But I could grab the gradient and maybe pull the brights down a little bit, maybe bring the darks up. I might even go into the grain type and play around with that and change it to maybe sprinkles or actually stippled is one of my favorites because it just gives us this really nice black and white, which is going to blend great but I can just adjust the contrast here, maybe the intensity, click OK, and then again play around with this interactively after the fact. So maybe that's a little too dark. I could just bump this down a little bit so it has that grain to it. And then I could apply that same style to all of my other objects just by first eliminating the objects that are redundant. So this one right here I don't need. 
but I could take this one and sample this color from it. And there we go, that exact same style has been applied. That will also help some of the other elements, like these uh, little bushes down at the ground have also been applied in a very similar way, where there's a grain layer on top and then a solid layer below it. So I'm going to get rid of these transparent grain versions. delete those, and then grab all three of these uh, objects and change their opacity up to 100%. And I want to make sure that I preserve this green color by just copying it into my clipboard, sample that, and then I'm going to use my eyedropper to grab the appearance of that green and everything that's been built into that. Then I can go into the fill color and change it back to green. And we can adjust all of the gradients on each one of these individually. I could rearrange some of these objects. It looks like this one should probably be in front, so I'll move it up. But giving that little bit of grain kind of helps separate the, uh, the two different bushes right there. But adding in this grain kind of helps separate out those two different plants. So if I just added, uh, you know, brought this up a little bit, maybe made that a bit darker, then you can see a little bit more se separation here. And maybe we need to take that a little bit further. That's kind of blending into each other. So I could add a stroke on this copy and just make it a darker version of that green and then make sure the stroke goes behind the fill of both fills actually and then just play around with it. Maybe sample this green to start and then bring up the color panel so I can just make it a little bit darker. Pull that down and then maybe increase the stroke just a little bit. Actually that's going to need more than that. Something like this and there we go. Now it's just got a little bit of a shadow. Maybe that's not quite dark enough so I'll bump that down. And for some reason it's been set to 11% and multiply. So I'm going to turn that up to 100% and normal. And there we go. Now that color is really popping off there. Probably doesn't need, be, need to be quite so uh, thick anymore. But just giving a little bit of a, an outline there can help separate the two. Or, you know, I also could have just made this one slightly darker green. There's lots of ways to do this kind of thing. So just keep that in mind when you're overlapping objects like this that need to have a little bit more depth to them. So obviously, if you just continue working on this and apply this style of grain to everything else, it becomes much more easy to adjust. But another note that I would have is just that the colors probably because of the way that the grain was applied just feel a little dull. So why don't we just grab everything and go into our recolor art and then just take a look at some of these individual colors. Maybe we can even start by just making a global adjustment and bring up the brightness a little bit of everything. And actually it looks like I didn't get the background. Maybe those objects are locked. Yeah, so let me make sure everything is selected. Go into my recolor art, into edit, and then my global adjustments right here and turn up the brightness of everything. And this way we can just get a little bit more of this uh, entire image to pop. And I don't want to overdo it, obviously. It's making this green way too saturated, so maybe I'll pull some of these greens down. But uh, then I'll just play around with the brightness of everything. Maybe increase the saturation just a little bit. That's probably way too much. But something like this. And then maybe I'll find like one of these blue colors like the sky here, and we can add some more contrast between it and the house. Those two colors are kind of blending into each other right now, so maybe we want to make it even more green or purpley, just so that it separates from that actual house a little bit better. Then maybe these bushes could be less yellow, somewhere more in here. And then that ground plane, we need to find that color. Let's see where that is. There we go. This is the ground plane. So maybe I just want to make this something that's a little bit more darker green and then shift around the bushes colors a little bit so that they pop off of there. Now this color obviously you can tweak this a lot but I think the biggest issue was everything just feeling a little too desaturated and too similar in value. Because of that the house is really blending into the background so maybe we just shift all this over not quite so purpley pink and more of a red pink. And obviously I'm doing this very quickly, so it's not turning out that great. But if you brought all of these colors to a more similar place in the, the spectrum of the colors, you could really improve the way that this is looking. And so obviously this one is completely off. So why don't we find that one object, get rid of that grain layer, and then 
sample the color from one of the other objects. And there we go. Now it's a little bit more consistent. So I would just continue that process throughout the entire illustration and make adjustments so that the house has a good separation from the background, that ground plane and the bushes all have their own little section in that color spectrum so that it's all much easier to look at. And the entire background actually has that same grain on it. So maybe if I went into that object and changed the grain type from regular to stippled, then it'll match the style of everything else a little bit uh, more consistently. I could play around with that and then maybe turn the opacity down on the entire thing just a little bit so it's not quite so intense. Something like that. And then the background itself might even benefit from being a gradient. If I grab the gradient tool uh, and then change the light color to being a more saturated blue, let's find my RGB sliders and make it something that's like a nice saturated sky blue. And then take the lower color and make it a version of that blue just by uh, using my eyedropper and then make it a little less saturated. The closer to the horizon, a lot of times you'll see less saturation. And then maybe shift the hue over so it's a little bit more green too. But I want that to be nice and bright and then I'll just bring up that color swatch on that gradient so that we get a little bit more atmosphere there. So a lot of things that you can do to play around with this scene to give it more depth. I could do something very similar with the grass here that I did with the background uh, sky layer. Again, removing that redundant grain shape and then applying this same gradient and then going into that gradient and changing it from blue to being green. Maybe not so saturated and shift that hue around a little bit and get to my hue saturation brightness. And then again, sample that green and make a little bit of a modification to the overall color. There we go. And then I can modify this shape just a little bit to give some more depth here. And to make it easier to see how this is all being contained, I'm just going to make a clipping mask the size of my document to contain that shape within. Make sure my background texture gets turned back on. And then that clip group, move that all the way to the top. Let me put it down at the bottom, call that grass. All right, hopefully you were able to follow along with that. I realize I'm kind of just mumbling through this and trying things on the fly, but hopefully you can see the steps that I took are really adding a lot more depth to the entire scene and making a lot of the actual creation of the art much simpler by eliminating redundant steps. <laughs> And that, my friends, is it for episode four. We've only got one more episode of the dojo left, and it'll come on the very last day of Extended Critique. This should give you plenty of time to finish your final project and to make it into something that you'll be proud to feature in your portfolio. Good luck, and I'll see you soon.